So uh, today actually marks the first uh, meeting of the Family Business Consortium uh, that was in the making for uh, quite a few uh, quite a few months, and it is represented by um, to my right here, uh, Dr. Tani Gorfi, uh, the Dean and President of ESCA uh, School of Management uh, in Morocco. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Sirani, uh, Associate Dean uh, of the RIN uh, uh, School of Business at the American uh, University of Beirut. Dr. Shabir Khouri, the Associate Dean at uh, Puzak uh, School of Business in uh, Lebanon as well. And Dr. Martin West, the uh, Dean of the College of Business Administration at the Atlanta University in the UAE. Uh, very, very, very quickly, the, uh, the objective of the consortium, which is, by the way, at, at, at AUC, obviously, by the way, the founding members uh, uh, actually uh, just kicking off the consortium. In the years to come, we look forward to uh, introduce and uh, be joined by other schools of business from the MENA region, which is the coverage of the consortium. The main objective of the consortium is to highlight the importance, uh, the challenges, and opportunities that family businesses uh, face. Uh, a number of uh, a targeted strategic objective uh, by the consortium is to uh, offer uh, uh, and become a research hub to the area of family business, as well as offer uh, executive uh, education programs in this uh, in this domain. Uh, if you look at the literature, especially in the context of the MENA region, there is not much that is being said uh, on family business. Yet again, if you look at the structure. Uh, uh, the opportunities uh, across uh, the economies of the MENA region, you find that uh, family business uh, actually play a big deal. Uh, I don't see the MENA region as uh, one size fits all. Uh, I'm sure there are differences, but there are also similarities. Uh, and um, over the years, there were so many family businesses from different parts of the region who migrated to other parts of the region. And I'm speaking here, for example, uh, like the, the, the syro libanese uh, uh, families who moved to Egypt uh, in the late uh, uh, 1800s. Uh, but there are also uh, others who moved uh, across uh, the region. So today, this morning, we've discussed issues uh, of uh, uh, activities uh, uh, moving forward. Obviously, uh, no, you're no stranger that when it comes to family business, uh, the issues that always comes uh, on top of the agenda are uh, succession planning, sustainability, uh, governance, uh, investments, uh, management, the culture within the organization, how the business is being run, and obviously there are variations uh, across uh, the board. Having uh, introduced uh, our guests uh, from the region, very quickly I'm going to introduce uh, my colleagues from the school. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdelmigid, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies and Administration. Uh, Shirin Gali Maula, the uh, Director of the Office of Internationalization. Uh, Safa Abdoun, uh, the uh, 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 Manager for Strategic Initiatives at the uh, Office of the School, of, uh, the Dean of the School of Business. Uh, Dr. Maha Murad is the Chair of the Department of Management. Dr. Ali Almi, uh, Professor of Management, but also the Director of the Government Center. Dr. Ashraf Shita is uh, a professor uh, at school and he teaches entrepreneurship and management. Sally uh, Abbas, uh, she has a new uh, post, and I have to admit, I forgot the title. Please uh, go ahead and go on stage. I have a full regard solution. You know, it, it's matching the, 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 the subject. She's been just recently, she didn't join the school recently, she's been in the school for many years, but she just joined that, that uh, post very, very recently. Dr. Nirmin Shahata heads our uh, case writing uh, center. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Mehda Wedi is the associate dean for executive education and external relations. All right, uh, let me again do the honors of introducing our guests. Very quickly, as I said, I'm going to just take a snapshot of what is in there. Let me introduce, uh, starting by uh, Samir Alani, chairman and chief executive officer of C Capital Holdings. Malta Company is the, the, uh, the single family uh, office that manages the financial interests of his family. In 1983, he founded Nesco, a family owned business in the shipping services sector, including marine and engineering services, which is a shipping agency engaged in international trade for water and various cargo handling activities. So, a business in the uh, shipping uh, industry. 
Mohamed El Dabati. Mohamed is the vice chairman of the board of directors, managing director for planning and supervision, Arabian Food Industries uh, company, uh, better known as Domti. Uh, he has been with the company uh, for over 12 years. Obviously, it's in the food and beverage industry. He contributed to the growth of the company's business from 100 million Egyptian uh, pounds to over a billion and 700 million in less than uh, 12 years. The Arabian Food uh, Industries Company, established in 1990, had, uh, as he rightly sa uh, says it, uh, had a humble beginning offering a, mo uh, uh, a number of products with only two types of white uh, 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 mozzarella cheese uh, and so on, and then it grew exponentially across different uh, uh, directions. Uh, Hatim Azawi is the managing director of uh, uh, Pico Agriculture. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Pico is uh, a leading agriculture company in Egypt, with integrated business covering the agriculture value chain uh, from propagation to cultivation and export. Uh, and the assets are, 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 are huge, uh, Dutch wood, uh, with uh, employing uh, 2,500 employees. And I insist to say that because uh, uh, it's all about creating jobs and making a difference uh, on the society. Uh, moving on to uh, Amal Sweedi, uh, Chairman and Executive, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Sweedi uh, Electrometer uh, Company. He founded actually in 1998. Uh, uh, he also comes from uh, a family business with diversified portfolio. He's also the President of the Egyptian Brazilian Business Council and Board Member of the Engineering Export Council. Uh, Lobna Farid. Uh, Chief Executive Officer, Media Decoration, Furniture, Lighting and Art Divisions. Obviously, again, the Baraka Group, a very diversified uh, portfolio in retail and fashion industry, uh, uh, established back in 1979. Uh, 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 Logna holds a number of executive positions in the uh, Baraka Group. Uh, Pat Bagheri, uh, of, uh, she's the Managing Director of uh, Aza Fahmi Jewelry. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 a mega international luxury design house that brings different cultures and heritage. Uh, and I have to tell you, I'm wearing one of her, her products uh, through its unique uh, contemporary design uh, uh, starting in 1969. Uh, uh, Megan Mansi, uh, Chief Executive Officer Mansi Eyewear, uh, started off, uh, he started off his business 30 years ago, specifically the eyewear business, but the family business was operating back since the 1950s. He took the lead alongside uh, his uh, uh, family in focusing on the market in Alexandria uh, uh, in the eyewear uh, uh, world. Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Nawara ventured into business growth, rendering Al Manar regional expansions in Egypt and North Africa with diversified products and global alliances and representation. Under his management, Al Manar uh, won contracts from uh, global players like uh, Honey, uh, Well, and others in regional countries, still having unprecedented growth in the business. Al Manar Group was established back in 1975 as an import company, and today Al Manar Group stands as proud as leading, experienced, and constantly growing company with a wide range of activities, including import, export stores, manufacturing, and distribution. To my left, uh, Mustafa Sahang, Executive Chairman of International Business Associates. Group for Money Transfer and Chairman Emeritus of Serhan Group of Investment. Again, he uh, actually has also uh, filled and uh, tours academia. He's a senior fellow at the uh, also Center for Applied Ethics with an affinity in the intermediary fields of leadership, business ethics, faith, religion, and responsible management uh, decision making. He's also a regular uh, uh, lecturer at the Darden School of uh, Business. The Sahang Group of Investment is a regional holding and private equity company with dual headquarters in Egypt and Switzerland, specializing in systems build up and systems integration in the agriculture, gas, oil, protection, and IT sector. Last but not least, for sure, Belia Riyadh, the corner there, uh, international relations and logistics manager at Sodico Specialities. She's uh, responsible for negotiation and development of new distribution contracts and agreements with uh, foreign and local supply companies. Uh, the company was established back in 1991 as a specialized contracting company, subsidiary companies of Serico Group, a well-established firm in the Egyptian market with several independent and related subsidiaries. I'm also extremely pleased uh, to be joined by my good friend, uh, Rimi Sadi, the principal manager, advice for small business program at EBRD, and one of our own, uh, Chantal Sabal, is the associate, uh, uh, again, with the same uh, department at EBRD. I was just saying earlier today that uh, when, we, when I thought of putting together 
a very uh, wealthy uh, represented family business uh, uh, owners and, and, and change agents, uh, we were looking at diversity, we were looking at uh, uh, sort of uh, spread across different sectors. I did not really look at the affiliation of the AUC. But actually, out of the 12, we were missed, by the way, by, uh, again, another good friend, Amr Alam, who was confirmed, just got, a, got a, uh, an urgency in his office, and he just uh, apologized. Uh, and the last, but not least, Ahmed Bet is actually, he's parking and can't find space. <laughs> All right. So again, uh, looking at the 12 who are supposed to join us now, 11, 10 are actually associated with the school or graduates of the school. So I'm going to be seeing you pleased with that. But this was not the intention, by the way. We we're looking for uh, diversity uh, as much as possible. I hope I was not very, been very, very quick, but I just wanted to provide a, a, an intro to everybody. We're going to kickstart the conversation by uh, overview done uh, by Samir uh, al on family business at large with some directions, pointers, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, technology is always happening. <laughs> Different. So the maximum years of business for any company is 
will never exceed 40 centimeters. And uh, they met for the first time in their life the transition in between the years 2000 and 2005. This was the first transition ever in the Egyptian family owned business. Ever. This was the first time they ever faced transition issues. Not before and not after. This was the time when the business owners at the time were between 60 and 70 years of age. At the time. So what's the DNA of that term? What's the DNA of the Egyptian business family owner? People will differ with me with this, but this is very basic. People will differ, but this is what happens. First, the reason of the existence of the family owned business is to provide all the financial needs, the working needs of the family members. The family members. This way, with the family members is the most important thing. And the problem, of course, she needs to talk about them, leadership, succession, family employment, who should be in what job, distribution of profits, shareholders' pressures inside and outside, work responsibilities, who does what, very important, and accountability and governance. Okay? And the management side, the people can differ with me, but this is what happens at the end, basically. The management jobs go to the family members. Whether you like it or not, this is what happens. And you can say, no, I'm, we are very, I don't know, uh, compliant and so yes, but at the end of the day, the main important jobs are good family members. There's an acute shortage of Egyptian trained management to fit family owned businesses because the management side is different. And the governance, governance is not for of course, there are some cases where the company becomes too big, listed on the stock exchange and so on. They cannot have informant, but this is a, this is the general uh, you know, tendency. Uh, the story of Egyptian uh, family-owned businesses is parallel to the history of the, private, the transition of Egypt to, to uh, the private economy. So we are mirroring what's happening. For example, the, the birth is when they started the open door policy. Uh, the creation of the stock exchange helped and changed the way we, we sort of exits put for attracting money. Uh, uh, private equity and cross-border acquisitions started the started somewhere in the uh, 96, 98. These are the first times when we saw uh, private equity. Uh, and you have to know that privatization and liberalization of sectors, which is a process that is continuing up to now, started from 92 and is ongoing. And liberalization of sectors is very important because not all sectors, as private sector, we were allowed to work. We were not allowed to work in all sectors. In shipping, for example, private sector shipping started here. Before it was full government. So in 1996 was the real birth of private ship agencies. And the court was not allowed. So there's two things privatization and liberalization. We face a lot of problems. We were just speaking about some problems before. We face the capital inadequacies. The lifetime of those uh, FOBs is short, it's not big enough to allow us to have capital accumulation. So we all face capital inadequacies. We have management issues. The market we are, we are in, it's very important characteristic, is one of the lowest uh, GDPs in the, per capita in the area. So the bank power of the consumers is very small in our market. And this is an adverse effect of the market. We have laws and regulations, bureaucracy, taxation, so all those problems we face. And they are big problems. Okay. The work culture of the people working in the company is mainly these points. Relationships are more important than uh, competing trust. The relationship with members of the family, the man, is more important than competing trust. Time limits are less, uh, lax. There is uh, uh, harmony in those companies. It's valued more than speaking your mind. Uh, you have to conform and accept the general tendency. The role of women in the family on business is improving very much. Uh, the labor law and enforceability uh, really ties the hand of the management very much. The promotions within the family companies are not regulated, not transparent, not, not, not there really. And financing of, of, of those uh, is always a problem. And in spite of all those problems, there are a handful of different international 
uh, uh, some companies have become international and some have, are doing very well uh, listed on the stock exchange. So in, in, uh, in, uh, there's a survey done by uh, one of the regional management consultants in the area in 2016. Uh, the average age of the second generation is between 30 to 40 years. And 61% of them of the second generation are within this year. And this is what they have to say, that the leadership style is different, that the company strategy will change, they will apply corporate governance, and will take more risks. So I think the future is much better than possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elements, at least in the context of the family business in Egypt, the history, the, the challenges, the, uh, the turning points, the issues that are being faced now in terms of education, training, governance, uh, continuity. Uh, interesting to, to see the figure that 70% die with the, with the death of the owner of the, well, not much succession plan here, uh, nor, uh, you know, uh, business continuity. So, uh, again, thank you, Samir. Uh, the objective of this session is actually, given the uh, introduction I made and the issues uh, that we as a consortium, we intend to uh, uh, address and try to offer uh, services to the community, not just to the, uh, to the university uh, community, including students, but to the community at large, either through uh, 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 research, through case studies, through uh, seminars, through executive education. Uh, I think the objective of this session is to actually listen, listen from you uh, on, uh, on, on specific issues that relates to your businesses or to the business at large, because there might also, uh, there might also be differences and variations across different sectors. Like, for example, Samir mentioned up until 96, there was not, it was not allowed for the shipping industry to be privately owned. So I'll just open the floor. Um, uh, feel free to, to jump in and comment, because uh, following that session, we will be, and obviously you are more than welcome to, 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 to join us, we will be developing the action plan uh, as we move forward. And I think the action plan uh, would be primarily based on uh, the input we received from the family businesses for which they actually consult you is, is established to serve. So uh, I'll just... Uh, Anybody wants to take the, the initiative and, and, and shoot first? Please. Uh, I didn't attend the day from the start. Okay. But if you can just brief us about the main purpose of this round table, and how it's going to continue, what do we want to achieve? Lena, <laughs> how we didn't attend the day from the beginning. And that, that will help a lot. Okay. Maybe I went very quickly in the beginning. Uh, so, consortium is put together by the five schools present today to help address the issues faced by family businesses. Uh, the way we can address that, given the nature of our business, is through awareness seminars, training programs, writing case studies to show successes and failures, the challenges, the opportunities, uh, and so on. This morning, uh, yeah, common research across 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 the region. So the consortium actually covers the MENA region. Uh, so this morning, uh, it was partially uh, admin of how the consortium is going to move forward, but also trying to frame how we can best support the different businesses, family businesses, uh, through our respective programs. We've gone uh, around. Uh, 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 of uh, input from the respective uh, uh, schools attending. Uh, some actually offer courses in, in family business, some don't. Some are in the pipeline to offer that. Uh, for example, in the context of AUC, Ashraf actually uh, showed uh, the fact that we didn't have a course, then we started introducing courses, and then we started receiving almost double the number of students each semester uh, more than the one before which he said is showing a greater interest in, in, in that area. Uh, moving forward, the plan is that consortium should be moving in the region at, uh, of uh, uh, organizing events at this context, as, as we speak now, uh, uh, Lebanon uh, and, and UAE. But as I said, there will be other schools that are going to be invited into the consortium. 
doing what? Again, uh, sharing the uh, uh, collective uh, information we're going to grab from the market and, 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 and again sharing it uh, with the community. One of the ideas that, uh, that, that, that came uh, in the conversation this morning was to do a mapping, a mission mapping of, of, of the, the infrastructure, for example, in the respective countries. Uh, who's there, doing what, and so on and so forth. And there has to be a starting point. Again, even the starting point, if you have any suggestions for that, uh, to our knowledge, there is not much that is out there in terms of data. Uh, our, our, our initiative is there to increase the level of awareness and showcase uh, the successes and failures for others uh, to, learn, uh, to learn from. So that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what was discussed uh, uh, today. Anyway, Mohammed. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges uh, that he was mentioning is totally right. Uh, I have had an experience in, uh, in our company, I'm the second generation. Of course, the most important thing is the uh, ability for the owner to be flexible with the second generation to enter. And I had this opportunity with my father. Other than that, we always have a bit of fights of different generations. So that's the, the first challenge that we have. In order to maintain the uh, family business without any problems, I think that we need to transact on the company. For, uh, for Donkey, for example, we went to the public. Uh, being a public company, if I do business in a public company, I think this solves many of the issues that we're having. Uh, you mean in terms of governance and so on? Of course. Because you're forced to do so. You're yeah. forced to uh, have an organized company, you're forced to inject new management tools, you cannot play around with uh, getting family members. Uh, every now and then, uh, at the same time you give uh, some cash to the original owners so you won't have a problem of any pressure of uh, cash the profit distribution or anything. Uh, and stock market is not the only option, option. private equity is another option, uh, but with the uh, representative owners in the board, they are always uh, giving an eye on, on the operation. Uh, so I think by the end of the second generation, any family owned business should have some sort of transaction. Uh, whether it's uh, public uh, getting listed, of course, this is the hardest uh, part for getting private equity. Uh, these are the solution to maintain as uh, as long as possible. Uh, this prevents most of the challenges that uh, we're having and this can sustain the business for the Just a quick question and a reaction to what you just said. Being a second generation, you've been in the business for over 20 years. How much do you see the 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 dividing line between management and governance? Again, at the beginning it was not there, to be honest. Again, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it was 100% family business. But again, uh, despite the poor bad background that I have from AUC to implement, uh, I, of course, I had a better uh, view of technology and all management uh, techniques more than my father, for example, uh, and he helped me in introducing that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that we are in a totally different position of the being public. Because again, it's, uh, you're exposed. Uh, every single thing you're doing is exposed. Uh, again, it's, it's totally different story. So uh, whatever was done in 10 years is totally different than what, what I personally faced in the last couple of years. And I think going forward, the improvement should, uh, should continue. We are forced to do that because we're under the public eye. Okay. Okay. I back from Muhammad and uh, also uh, Mr. Samir. First of all, our company was established in 1975 and then it's uh, perfectly applicable uh, 43 years. And I joined the company in 1997, so uh, it was a 25 years old, or 22 exactly years old company. We face the same challenges of the different management styles and so on. Actually, we are not a public listed company, but we apply to just I was telling uh, Sally just last Wednesday, we finished a one-year uh, governance project in our company. We finished the project. It's a corporate governance project. And also a family governance, slightly family governance in the aspect of the family hiring policy. Uh, now the third generation in the family, uh, some of them have already graduated from the university, so, uh, and some of them joined the company. Uh, of course, the challenges of uh, succession, uh, sustainability, and uh, management style, and all, all these aspects are relevant. That's why we thought of uh, uh, not to wait 
for any pressure coming from being public or uh, uh, approached by a private equity or so. Although we, we are in a position with some private equity firms, but we started this project before that, yeah, one year back. My experience is that, uh, like Mohammed said, it's a totally different uh, uh, way of doing business. It's very exciting. It, 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 now we have, for example, an active board with uh, independent members. Uh, you can see how far I am as a CEO is being accountable for many actions. And I'm, I'm used that to take decisions without anybody asking me why I, did I take these decisions. But now I have uh, a board to, to, to report to. Of course, uh, uh, the family hiring policy part helps a lot in uh, lifting any pressure within the family to hire uh, uh, just for hiring because simply he's a family member. We have a criteria now, we have a policy, and uh, not everybody will fit to this policy. Uh, so it's a big challenge to the family member to, to try to, to, to join the, the, the group. Uh, I think that generally the, the, the problems in the family business are more or less the same, but it's, it all depends on how far you want the company or you see the company in 10 years or 15 years. If you th think that you are still on board as a family owning this business, you have to act from today in uh, succession and sustainability and so on. So. Uh, I would like uh, to take the point that Ahmed uh, just uh, mentioned uh, related to corporate uh, governance and the family succession and I would like to share with you something, a real story that happened. Uh, in all family businesses we struck with the fact that uh, uh, either our parents or grandparents were at the head of the organization and they are coming from a totally different uh, ecosystem than ours. And then uh, for a reason or another we are uh, faced with a situation where we have to lead that organization. In, uh, in 30, uh, 33 years ago, when I, I graduated 34, 35 years ago, and then 33 years ago, um, I wanted to go and, and fulfill my dream of academia, and then my grandfather was agonizing, so I had to come back from where I was to take the lead of the organization. My uncle at that time passed away a couple of years ago, uh, was at the helm of the organization, it, mentality that it was totally different than the one that I was accustomed to. I'm coming from the Nasser uh, era, so we used to stand in, in, in Gamaya and to, to, to buy uh, uh, chicken and so forth. He was coming from the, the Geneva concept, totally different. Uh, the point that I wanted to tell you is that throughout all those years I was faced with a situation where company, uh, the companies that were diversified in different areas, different sectors, um, um, were totally run uh, different than what uh, they are uh, run now. And in 2007, uh, I decided to do corporate governance. So I brought every Tom, Dick, and Harry of the world to teach me how to do corporate governance and to accept the fact that it was time that I put a firewall between the family ownership and the management of the organizations, whether they are in Egypt or elsewhere. I have to admit that it was not an easy ride. And it was even a worse decision uh, I felt at one time when my brother, who to whom I have, uh, I have left the organization. That's why you find that she said that I'm chairman emeritus of Senegal for investment. All of a sudden, uh, I was faced with a situation that uh, after uh, I handed over to him the organization, and he signed to, to step down a year later, 2008, uh, 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 he said that he does not want to, to continue the business. So I convinced him, and, uh, and we continued the, the business until 2016. And in 2016, he passed away. So all of a sudden, I found myself in a situation where I have to go back to the family business to take care of that business. The point that I'm making here, the most important uh, uh, challenge was not that, because this is God's gift. I mean, we, 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 we are born to die at one point in time. But the most important challenge is, Am I ready internally to take care of the business or not? In 2007, one professor came and told me, listen Mustafa, the best thing that you have to do is to create an executive body. And that executive body survives the family. So if the family do not exist anymore, this executive body will take the organization and ensure its continuity. I've, at that time, I did not really listen to actually it was a her, 
So I told her, listen, uh, Jacqueline, I think you're, you're, you're crazy. I do not accept what you're saying. She said, no, Mustafa, I urge you to do that. A year later, 2008, I've created this executive body. And this very executive body is the one that in 2016 managed to take the organization on to 2017. This is when I started to go exactly. <coughs> Made of 16 between senior uh, 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 vice president and vice president. All over, we have 35 countries all over the globe, and those are the the, the, the body that actually handle that in the infrastructure. So my message that I want to share with you: we, as family or members, should not count. What really counts is the executive body that we have. People who are smarter than us, who are more educated than us, and who are better connected than us. Today, I am the uh, third generation. My son, who is working, has been working with me for the last six years, is my fourth generation. And guess what? For him, when he came and joined, I told him the first lesson that you should do is to go and clean the bathroom. Clean the bathroom. Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Humbleness is the one thing that we tend to forego and forget. We think that we have amassed everything in our lives, whereas actually we did not. This is my second message to message for uh, family members, uh, uh, friends and colleagues. So when you go about corporate governance, you have to put your own input in the, into the equation. Do not only listen to consultants, because you are part of the ecosystem. You have to bring also value to that. At the end of the day, we are the practitioners, are the ones who are living in the jungle. We are the ones who are faced with situations and challenges every day. Sometimes we have uh, uh, results and, and the thing and issues that we need to exchange with the, 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 the academic world or the consultants. So please think deeply about that and think about investing in this executive body that will and should and ought to survive the family members. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sort of building off something you mentioned, and, and, and Samir actually alluded to, which is education and different backgrounds, uh, where the current generations are coming from versus the earlier generations. Uh, but you also said, uh, let go, bring in an executive body. How many of the family visit would do that? Maybe they know this is the right thing, but how many would actually do it? Many? Few? Maybe? Uh, I will build on what was said by uh, I'd like to thank Samir for such a fantastic insight, yeah, insight about uh, the whole family business. Uh, in any business cycle, there is a, any business uh, taking place, there is a growth cycle. Now, 80%, as Samir said, of the GDP is contributed to the small and medium sized enterprises. Okay, I will speak on behalf of the small enterprises. The challenge, as uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa has said, is uh, to attract smarter people than us to form an executive body. Now, most of the small enterprises face that challenge of attracting the right people because the career path present on the job is very limited in the presence of just one man show. This is why the companies die after 43 years. Uh, to develop that, you need the business to be at a certain volume to attract the right talent that can grow with the business to take it to another dimension. Now, where do you attract that talent? Because there is not a current learning forum that breeds such executives at different level. They come at a high price, so uh, a, a second generation company might be able to sustain the salaries and uh, attract the, ex the excellent right talent through uh, head hunting or whatever it is. But for small enterprises, it still remains a challenge. What is the right balance? Where do we interject to get? The, uh, the executive board that you're asking for. Aside from the fact that most of the uh, family businesses or the single man show do not think that they need such an executive board. It takes quite some time of maturity to understand that uh, it is uh, the, uh, the skills needed might not be in your son or your uh, cousin or whoever is present on the scheme of, of the family and to put them aside needs uh, quite uh, a vision to grow them. Thank you. Uh, 
in the lifespan in a family, there must be something or someone to call the disruptor. The disruptor is the person who really disrupts what you just said. You are absolutely correct. These are all challenges and it is a problem and it is not simple and they are very expensive. But somebody like you should stand up and say, listen guys, I am the disruptor. I came here to change things. And they're not, come to be, they're not going to be easy. You will sweat. You will have problems. You are going to invest money. You are going to put hours. But in the family uh, span of life, somebody has to stand up and say, I am the one who's going to do it. it is there a, a, a magic uh, formula for it? No. And I guess this is the only one. What you said is about the uh, here, when it comes, you apply your personal guts to the consulting concept. Uh, in a small business, maybe you should not apply 100% of the governance with the board the number of and you might tailor this to suit your business, but it's not all of them. You can pick some and take it step by step, but say you have the vision to maybe in five years, maybe when you arrive to uh, or reach a certain uh, uh, business uh, level or business uh, size. Uh, size, yeah. But yeah, it's not all money. Yeah. And this, when it comes your guts in input, in the input, you don't take it. Yeah, okay. What I'm saying is that the academia need to step in and take a look at the small enterprises because they are the bulk that generate. In retail, one out of four jobs are uh, one, one out of four jobs are in retail in the U.S. according to what was in 2008. So there is a big bulk for small enterprises. We contribute uh, 80 something in the U.S. They say it's 90. I don't know what the percentage is, but definitely there, there should be some sort of, uh, as I say, ecosystem to, to find such executives at, at an early stage to take them give them the chance, and this is what the family business needs to decide, that yes, we're investing in new staff, we're investing in new ideas, okay, and, but this is the only way to grow, and that's the disruption. We agree that we might lose something, but in the end, we will gain. But <clears throat> what is the right step? Where is the forum? Well, what is the manual? Uh, all this is just uh, learning at your own expense, and uh, there is nothing uh, as 100% right or 100% wrong. There's always uh, room, and there's always maneuverability, uh, and the right... Uh, Gutsy decision might might end you in something that you least favorable, but definitely a cooperation with uh, the UC and cooperation with all the academia would help us find more executives or bring more executives to develop uh, this sector more. I want to comment on that. Let me hear first. No, I just wanted to say that I think the, the challenges are very different at different stages of the business. Uh, the so if we're, if we're talking about the earlier stages, they're definitely attracting talent, financing. And attracting talent saying we are a viable company. You don't have to go work in a multinational for us to, because we need that kind of talent. Uh, but also from the family side, side, institutionalizing the business and separating the family members on a very simple level. I'm not talking about big governance exercises. I'm talking about making sure that there's a clear role for the family members versus the, the team empowering the team to feel like they, I mean the, the management team, to feel like they have an input. I personally believe that the problems um, might get bigger as the companies grow, however they have their solutions for them, because you have the money to make to get the solutions. So the challenges that I faced when I joined the company 18 years ago are very different from today when I can afford to get the IFC to do a governance exercise for me and get all the consultants and for us to believe in it. So I believe for bigger companies, the challenges are easier, I must say, but require a lot of vision and um, following up on that vision. And I agree with what you said. Uh, we are currently going through that exercise of governance and separating. We said, this brand lives on. I might not be here. Azel might not be here. And Nina, my sister, might not be here. How does this brand live on without the three of us? And that's actually what we're working on now. Succession in design, succession in management. I'm, I said I want to step away from being CEO. I want a CEO. I will remain involved in the business. But what is the vision you have? Is this just for you and, and that's it? Or is it a vision of this lives on and then how do we make it live on? Different stages, different challenges. And I just want to build on something that Maggie mentioned. And again, a question I don't need an answer. But you mentioned the, 
uh, uh, processes, documentation, and so on. I'd be surprised to know how many of the family business have updated, documented procedures and regulations and bylaws of how to run the business, or is it just done, you know, informally? Again, to echo your point, uh, I'm not here. Who's following what procedures? Uh, that's uh, that's another. Uh, who was raising, uh, yeah, Reem and then Ahmed and then Lohman, yeah. So we answer my experience at CBRD, what we do usually is we help small and medium enterprises. When we define SME, it's up to 50 million euros. So basically the whole country fall within the definition. So what we do is that we provide advice and finance. But advice is where we get in touch with the, with the business and we do a lot of diagnostic. And 100% of our 800 SMEs that we work with are family business. So my, my my feedback is that it's a commitment issue. So everybody knows what's right and what's wrong, and everybody knows how to get corporate governance. And sometimes we even do corporate governance exercise, and it's just uh, for La Forme, they just put it in the drawer. So it's all about the commitment of the owners to give up, actually, the, 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 the ownership, the management, the, the feeling that this belongs to me, and I don't want anybody to interfere. So there's a lot of psychology in it. It's not about what's right and what's wrong. And we have seen even the generation gap, the decision making in very simple things, or uh, how uh, authoritarian a father can be in a board meeting <coughs> with, with, with the cousins and the kids, and the higher fight. You can hire, you may not may or may not hire your son or cousin, but can you fire them? Is it easy to fire the son of your brother because he's not up to the standard as it's easy to fire uh, somebody who's not fulfilling the job? So there's a lot of complicated issues that I think we need not about how viable it is, it's viable, everybody knows there is no discussion about it. And what I find it challenging and what we need to take it further is to start early on, to start when the business was much smaller, not after 20 years when you realize that you need a succession plan because you're too big now and you don't want the brand to fail. But start when it's, it's very small, when you start parting the idea in the first five years, insert all those corporate governance ideas. It's very difficult because when we preach this to our SMEs, they know it's not a priority. Priority is not a market action plan, or to export, or to do something that increases the revenues. But to take them back to reality and say, like, why don't we do a family health check? It will cost you a bit of money now. Why don't we start by putting corporate governance? It costs money, and it doesn't pay back now. It pay back in like 20 years. So it's not an attractive advice. So, uh, what I want to say is that uh, in our family, I'm part of the second generation. And when the family started, uh, started back in 1938, and it was just like when every one of the brothers graduated, he joins his brothers. And it was going like that. But in fact, what happened is that in lack of organization or governments or whatever we call it. When every one of the brothers started growing, he went on his own. Why? Because he had the ambition to grow. The challenge I see is when you have a family business and you say that it's a company and every one of the family who graduate will join the company. This should not be the case. He should join the business. So joining the family business doesn't mean joining the company. And I fully agree with you, Mustafa, about having the executive team. I'm building the executive team, not putting in mind that any of my sons or my brother's sons or whatever will join. I'm building the team for the company to grow. And I know there's a generation gap because my sons are educated now. They're getting their education in the US. They had the different life exposure than we did. We lived in Egypt, we grew up in Egypt, and we grew up with the mentality that this is the job that I will have once I finish. I didn't have even a choice to go and apply for any multinational or anything. No, now they're getting internships at Facebook, at McKinsey, and only, I don't know when they come back, what kind of mindset they will have. But in my opinion, what I'm preparing for is as Muhammad uh, said, is preparing the company for private equity to join, for uh, maybe going for an IPO. 
but for them not to exit the business, not to exit the family business, but to open the door that when the new generation comes, they can come and join the family business, but not necessarily the company I'm leading. If they're interested, well and good. And this is what I'm, this conversation I had with them, told them, please come and learn what we are doing. If you're interested, let me know. If you're not interested, that I know that this business, we will exit and open room for them to come in with a new business. In my opinion, this is very important, and this is what we should be working on internally to prepare the mindset to look at the business as an investment business and let them come with ideas to invest in. Because if I tell them, come and do metering, I'm the one who found it, as you said, in 98. I was in the family business, and I founded the company as part of the family business, but it's a new business within the family. Nice. I think I've touched down on a very, very important uh, point, which is the education of the new generation. And uh, we're seeing a, a gap between, my, I, I feel a gap between myself and my father in terms of the management style and everything, but at the end of the day, we're coming from the same background. The problem is that the new generations now are all getting their education from the States and from Canada and from London. They will get uh, a reality shock when they come uh, into Canada. And, and that's, 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 a, that's a big problem. And, uh, we're, we're putting all the new generation in a bubble, in a real bubble. It's, uh, and I, th I think this, we will pay the price of that in the next 10, 15 years. Yeah. And all the uh, well-educated uh, Egyptians are all graduated from big universities abroad and they will not be able to, uh, when it comes to FMB, they will not be able to deal with salesmen and, 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 and drivers and workers in the factory because they, they don't see that side of the, the story. But, and I, and I think this is, this is something that we will face and this is something that we, anyone should take from now. It's a big issue. Sorry, yeah. You don't speak Arabic. This no, 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 you cannot write a formal no, no, no. government but letter. It's, 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 it's a big deal. Yeah. I always wish that AC could get better and better so that our kids would one day like to, to join. I wanted to talk about a very different challenge for me, being a woman, as Sabir was saying, women in family business is increasing. I had this very same challenge. The first, I, I started working the year I graduated. And um, it, it was a 25-year-old company, so the people working there almost uh, saw me get saw me getting birth. So I was like the baby, so they cannot understand how this little girl could come and join. So uh, my father's first thing he did was like uh, Mr. Mustafa said, he let me work in the optics workshop, where the basement was with the workers. He, I stopped working when I once fainted. <laughs> I cannot do it anymore, please let me out. So this is how it started. So I had this, always I had this challenge for a woman, a young woman, working, how come you cannot speak the same language, you don't, uh, because I started with working in office. And then bit by bit we started doing, uh, my cousin joined, so he's uh, a guy, he could be somehow uh, a, a figure. And then um, I stepped down from this and went to, the furniture division, which is more uh, lady style thing. And then it picked up. But uh, the challenge is always is the, the female getting inside such a thing is always a challenge. And then another challenge I always we always face is the talent acquisition. The high talented uh, staff, they don't want to join a local company or they don't want to, uh, they want all, they're looking for multinationals and uh, yes, stuff like that. And uh, final challenge we always have is that we work in very high-end items, retail, whether it's optics, jewelry, furniture. So whenever we want to go to the corporate level, we, we lose somehow the family essence or the personal touch. So I always have the challenge, how could I, how could I change this? Um, I want to move to a corporate level company. But I don't want to lose the personal touch thing. Maybe it could, uh, could uh, <laughs> because we work in the same field. He could understand because the person, for example, uh, 
buying the sunglasses or an optical glass. He wants to buy from the owner, from my father. He wants to him himself to take the measurements for him. So now we have 100 plus uh, stores. How could my father go to all these stores? So we had to somehow uh, put the right people in the right places. And I think it's working. <laughs> Just, just, I'm going to play the thumbs up. You still think years after you started working, the issue of men and women is still there? Yes. The same? Better or worse? By the way, you said you were selling a very small percent of your My head's a total of 40 percent of the female. Now I go to the factory, I go to the French factory. The people that I don't think they're going to be able to do it, right? Okay. Yes, it's actually still there very much, especially in our field. Uh, I'm not an engineer, uh, yet our company is a very specialized uh, engineering company. We're not contractors, we're specialized in uh, waterproofing system. So all our work actually is down, down there, 20 and 30 meters underground. So when I first joined, it was very, very, very uh, tough because the workers, the laborers in Egypt are actually their own men. So you just, I just had to put on the safety and the help and go down to get the, the on-hand experience. So it was very striking 15 years, 14 years back that uh, a young lady actually is going on site. It's not, it's not well seen until today. Until today, the day I decide to go on site, it's uh, Exactly like you were saying, uh, here So yes, until today, this uh, ladies' uh, issue is it's a problem. Especially exactly one thing that you were saying is that most of the employees we have, they go back 25 years back. They have been working with us. So actually, those people they saw me when I was a little kid. So now she's. She's there, she's, she's bossing around, she's just saying what to do, and she's not even an engineer. But being also not, we haven't studied engineering, for the succession, it's, it's very difficult because this company is built on the 100% uh, the on hand experience of my father. Uh, it's not only the name, it's his name. Uh, now, when we're called for a certain project, it's is called by his name. Uh, we have a problem in this. They don't call Sodico as the company. They yeah. call him maybe for his own uh, expertise. Uh, we work in national products. I recall for the fact since uh, President Sisi has been on, all this uh, construction uh, projects, it has been created. He receives calls directed to him. When they said, El Nata Dijor, Bokra Sok. This is exactly what happened. It's not a uh, matter of the uh, company, uh, it's a direct thing. Come and see. For not being an engineer, he feels like a big gap. So uh, I believe in the for this company to continue, uh, I cannot start studying engineering again. Yet. But <laughs> uh, we have we have an issue here. There's a problem. The, the know-how, mission, not in business or finance, that's it. So not the know-how and expertise, not to have the technical field, especially when you are a very technical company. Leave a right. question Please. on women representation on board because it's becoming one of our interests. All companies here have boards, right? So, how, ma how many women do you have on boards of the companies? And are they uh, appointed on the board because they actually add something or because they represent the family? Yeah, do we have a good representation of women on board that are actually. That's a good question, probably, right around the table. Uh, uh, we have to always <laughs> 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 Balance issues. But other companies, we have a percentage that don't, that's not no women, huh? No. Zero. Yeah, two women, me and my sister. Okay. <laughs> I'm the only one. I'm the only one. 
50% win. On the board? Yes. Oh, interesting. Oh, 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 Okay. Interesting. Uh, we have an entry on the people. We have, we have uh, uh, two women on board. Uh, oh, recently, uh, out of uh, nine total the, the, the board structure. Uh, I'd like to add a, a, maybe a different angle. Sure. Uh, in our business, uh, when, when I joined, we didn't have, uh, thanks to amateur generation, uh, we didn't have the, the cousins issue because at that point in time, not so many people joined the different companies. So I was focused on the agriculture, my other cousins were focused on other sectors, which helped a lot. We had a different issue. We had a family of 1,200 employees, and that's a different issue. These are the, the, this is the core that we had to actually transition. So when we made the decision that we want to grow governance, it was easier said than done. We need to do corporate governance with all the consultants on board, did all the runs, and then the reality on the ground was a bit different. So questions like, are we able to delegate enough? Are we able to give to, 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 to give people the space to operate? That was a big uh, obstacle. Not an obstacle, but a hurdle that we cleared. Second to that was, or one of the biggest challenges, was dealing with the rigid core of the company. So every company in its family business uh, transition and phase. First of all, you have to qualify for transition. Some family businesses continue to be small and continue to operate in a family way for it. And some other families, like, like many companies here, make the decision that they want to go institutional. So once you've made that decision, it depends on where you are. Are you, like you said, are you in a very young phase? Are you, uh, how many employees do you have? All these questions are, are very relevant. So in, in our stage, we were 30 years into the business, 12 to 1,300 employees. Uh, family members uh, large, so it was a very big challenge dealing with the rich. How do we respect the expertise that got, that got us this far, and how do we introduce new calibers that will always find it threatening to operate in this environment? This was one of the biggest challenges. So, being the change agent, like you said, is, is a very important thing. As a family member, we were all given the choice upgrade yourself or leave. We have uh, our, our seniors are a bit ruthless with this uh, with this matter in a very very uh, wise and correct way. So it was everybody was given a choice: upgrade yourself, find the best MBA in the world, go do it now, or find another job. So upgrading yourself is a key point. Killing your ego is a very important thing. So it's it's yes, the humbleness that you spoke about. Killing your ego in general is something that, that should be done. But I'm saying, but I'm saying in business. Because now you're going to hire new talents, and these talents are going to come on board and challenge you. Are you going to take this line when, when your HR director tells you, please do not sign this paper ever again before it comes through to me? How are you going to behave? How are you going to take that? So it's, uh, these are all things that we go through, but it's understood that we move from a stage of deciding that we want to do governance, delegating authority, holding people accountable, and then becoming a performance-driven institution. This is the sequence that everybody follows. The challenge is, is, is that you have a cultural shift at every, it's not one cultural shift and you're clear. You go through multiple cultural shifts through the institution. You need to bring the old and the new together. So when you say cultural change, there's one question that you need to answer. What is that change? What's that new identity that you need? Have you found your new identity? Have you as owners decided what that new identity should be? Before you start telling people that have been there for 25, 30 years, we need to change the culture and speaking all these big words, you need to actually have something more, more specific because change the culture to the new people that are coming, maybe that's not the best thing. But when you find the people employee, the personality that is, that is, that is people that you want everybody to be, then you can start to do the gap analysis with everybody on board, new and old, and move towards that. So that's, that's a big thing. And, and, and that cultural uh, shift and, and, and the rigid core and dealing with that and inviting new talents and protecting new talents is very important because you're going to put, we are in a farming environment, uh, uh, very geographically spread. You hire someone, he's fresh out of college, you throw them out in Bahia somewhere. If he doesn't have the right support, he, he, he's not going to last 72 hours because 
the board does not permit for new uh, uh, for new entrants very easily. So that's that's another challenge that we that we managed to overcome by respecting the people that built the ground up for sure, respecting their expertise, never ever forgetting that they are the reason why you are actually considering the transition. So um, you have to you have to find a way to make it work both of this. Uh, one, one, one other thing I said uh, on shaping the identity and the cultural fit when you're hiring onto that new identity, one of the biggest things in any interview now, almost as important as competencies, okay, as important as competencies is the cultural fit. So when we see two people, if one of them is maybe more qualified, more impressive, but uh, the individual has a personality, has an ego issue, it's not going to fit very well within the culture, you choose the one that's going to fit well within the culture because at the end of the day, it's, a, it's, it's, it's always a team play, never, never an individual approach. Embrace the bureaucracy, something we've all uh, uh, learned to do over time. At one point in time, it's your worst enemy. At one point in time, it becomes your best friend. It's real protection for everybody. So you need to love that bureaucracy. You need to understand that paperwork is, is boring, annoying. Make it efficient, make it smart. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture of why you're doing that but embrace the bureaucracy, no shortcuts, uh, uh, all of that stuff. And most importantly, you need to upgrade yourself as if you're going to be involved as an owner, manager, you need to upgrade yourself. You need to be able to reach a certain level whereby you can hire the best out there and be able to uh, uh, lead them uh, uh, into, into that direction. These are some of the, the, the challenges that we've gone, gone through personally in our company. Thank you. Very much. Um, well, Yes, please, Sandra. Uh, I have to say something, you know, uh, I'm very happy after all these years that ERC working with the five most small businesses. This confirms a lot of our conclusions, that the numbers we get from evaluations are random, but uh, all what you said here confirms that, first of all, everyone says what you say, so <laughs> this is like everywhere. The second thing that I don't see saying people who say is that governance at some point was for everyone started focusing on governance, for the coming of the second generation because many of them are coming in and how we are going to sustain and that. But today, as you mentioned, that so many families want to do government, governance, out have to do gov governance because their, gener their younger generations are not interested anymore. Now, whether they like it or not, they're going, the business is going to die. So now, this is a way to attract them better back because come on, with the exposure they have, they have so many opportunities and potential outside. Um, another big part of the culture of each company is that the, co the family business culture, Mahmoud McCann is advanced, they are not open for, for, for intruders to come. So no matter how respectful, no matter how educated they are, an advisory man, board member, he will push the or push the No matter how. So this will always remain how big or small the company is or how mature or not. So, and I think one, the one way that family businesses should start looking at think here, we have the internal ecosystem for internships. Internship is one way to force them accepting change. And it will come, it will never come from senior management, it will come from the bottom. So it's, what, if we have internships with young people coming with the young uh, Emela, not only uh, graduates, with accepting to work with uh, technical schools, accepting to work with to absorb the intact, the change will happen. But it will never happen from a decision on the board that we need to have for it. This will not work. So, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Why we have not touched on core systems and core beliefs and leadership style? Don't you think that those three elements, and here when I spoke about values, talking about what you believe in, not, not what you believe in in terms of religion. Yeah. What are your personal yeah. affiliation? What is your system of, uh, uh, of, uh, of value shaping? Yeah. And then, if I dare to say, what is your religious conviction? I mean, we have always been hearing, I've been hearing, what we have been discussing here in different uh, areas and different ecosystems. And the same thing again. When our kids are abroad and we send them to take uh, excellent uh, education abroad, we were not given this opportunity. They were been given this opportunity. When they come back, are they going to say, I'm not going to, f to follow your suit because 
I have been approached by Microsoft or by IBM or by Google or by Facebook or you name it and therefore I'm not interested in the business. But let us stop here and make one very important point. It is that business that made you go to Google and Microsoft and IBM in the first place. Does this mean that you should not go and I should put a firewall between you and your dreams? No. It only means that I am a failure. It is I I am to be blamed. I did not give to my son or to my daughter the ecosystem for them to thrive. And this is the th same thing that would apply to our colleagues at work. Listen, we do not have employees. We have colleagues who are working with us for one aim. Let us define our leadership style. Do you know that until last week there were 220 different leadership styles? 220 different. Which is one, which, which of those are, are ours? So I think that starting from inside and out is very important. Issues of dealing with uh, sexism and uh, women, men. Why are we even talking about it? This is an insult for the ladies around this table. We should not even think about them. Those are equal partners. Without women, the men should not exist around this table, period. If we're not believers in this, then we have an issue. We do not talk about these things openly, right? But we have to embrace them if we want sustainability and our company to, be to become a continuous business and to move from one generation to the other. What if my daughter today is the one and the heirs? Am I going to tell her, no, I'm very sorry, but your, your, your brother is going to be the heir? Of course not. My second in command is a woman because she's better. I have found out that give the education to the right people and the right people will thrive and the right people are everywhere. The last point that I want to make, if today I had a colleague of mine who did not thrive in his or her business and I had given him or her the opportunity to become better and they did not become better, then I need to stop and rethink again. Did I channel that individual in the right context or not? I mean, today I'm faced with this situation, somebody who is at the front end uh, uh, doing money transfer, and the guy is simply is incapable of doing a transaction in the correct manner. So I brought in his manager and I told him, what, what is, what, why is he, why is he that, 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 that? He said, he does not have uh, the, the mentality to do the transfer, he forgets. Then you know what I did? His manager was reprehended, not him. And then his director was reprehended. Then his VP was reprehended. Then I reprehended myself. I reprehended myself in front of my board because I failed. Come on, evidence, you can come and tell me, but listen, this can happen with a small company. If you have a, an education system from the bottom up, this can definitely be uh, something that uh, everyone in the organization lives by and dies by. So my message is, please, the one that I started with, core value, core belief system, and leadership style. And in leadership style, there is no one style. You can be dynamic, evolve, and with each situation, you can flip. There is nothing bad in that. And this is, should be at the epicenter of what we are doing as leaders of the organization, the family business. Sharif, I have one question yes. because this is getting exciting. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about the new generation joining the business. And how do you find it or is it doable that you tell your father, your mother, your uncle, that it's time to retire? I see every day business that are being created by the younger generation. Where the CEO or the chairman is 80 plus sometimes even 90 or anything is Saha. And they still go to the business, they still sign checks, they still interfere in decisions. I mean, are they capable or not capable? There should be an age or a time when the board can tell the chairman to step down. Is this something that happens in family business? Uh, yeah, I think in my experience, it's, it's uh, bound to, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> 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 It's, 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 it
they are well, يعني well uh, educated enough that they know when to let empower the second generation. And we step down. For example, in my in my in my uh, example, my father is 83 years old, and uh, he is no more the since 15 years he is no more the CEO of the company. He still, by the way, comes every day to the office. But he, he is not signing the day to day vision, just uh, briefing him every day about the strategic uh, matters. He's the chairman of the team. Uh, but I'm the vice chairman, so actually, I'm doing also. Uh, but uh, speaking of the, the second generation joining or the third generation joining the business, I have uh, from also I'm speaking about myself. Doing governance in, the, in my organization, it's not primarily. To, to smoothly let the third generation join the business without any problems. Actually, it's in the contract because when they decide not to join the company, the company will sustain and will. Because for, for me, I always think for, my commencement in the AUC was a Saturday, okay? And I joined the business Monday just because Sunday was the weekend in, the, in our business. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't take even one day to think about my future where to go and how to seek my future. I don't want, to, although it, 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 alhamdulillah, it, it went fine with me, but I don't want to do this to my son. I want to give him the freedom to choose wherever he wants to go. And if he decided to join the business, the environment and the ecosystem and the infrastructure is ready with the fairness between all the family members. But if he decides he wants to my, go to Microsoft or Google, the, the floor is open. Actually, I, I, I empower him to just see the world and see all the opportunities. And I have a very good business, uh, uh, well governed, whenever you are, you uh, want to. I uh, just want to say something. Not all family businesses want to move away from family businesses. And a lot of people, including me, I don't want to move away from any family business. At all, I've tried working in a corporate, and I failed, and I didn't like it. So we want to remain to be a family business. Yeah, I, mean, I guess uh, it depends on uh, there is a situation that happens on, on hand. Like, what you're saying, I had an incident with my dad, and he was like, no, I take this decision. And he took it, and it turned out not very correct. So at that point, I told him, now you put me in charge, please help me to be in charge. And this is where he started, OK, go ahead. <laughs> So I think it could depend on, again, instances, situations. Is that the retirement age? What you're saying is exactly what we're thinking about today in, in a, maybe a bit, bit of a different way. So we want to be institutionalized, but maintain that family yes. bond. I'm not that family sure. essence. I'm not because that sure that the two go it's, it's a possibility. <laughs> it's a possibility. It just makes your life a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a challenge, but it's a possibility because part of the family business, there is loyalty in the institution, there is, uh, there is, uh, there is a lot of good things yes. that can help you in that institutional element, but you also uh, uh, will get rid of a lot of, of, a lot of things that, uh, uh, that would not enable you to move forward if you don't have processes, if you don't have policies and procedures, things of that sort. So it's, it's, it's more of an institutional approach with a family, uh, this is the this is the, yeah. with a family vibe. This is if you can achieve that, yeah. you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm. I'm sitting here. I'm wearing two hats actually: the hat of uh, an assistant professor of marketing here, and the second generation in the family business. Okay. The and director of a program. Yeah. So uh, actually, um, in, 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 this, in response to your question, Nareen, um December first of every year. This marks uh, the start of a time where we prepare for uh, the New Year's holidays and so on. And my father comes and talks to me about him wanting to step down. And setting the date of January 16th, which is his birthday, to step down. Every Jan 16th come has been coming, and he never stepped down. <laughs> And he tells me, I'm fed up, I, I'm, I'm no more, uh, I cannot do it anymore, and he, he doesn't step down. This year, he decided to actually step down without telling me that he's stepping down. By going to 
the going and signing me all authority that I need in banks and everything. And it was intriguing to me what triggered you to do this. And it was health issues is one trigger to stepping down. But most importantly, believing in the second generation was his main trigger to step down. So I think instead of asking the question, when would they ste step down, the question should be, what triggers them to step down? Is it making institution of the, the organization, or for because they believe in the second generation, or because there is something outside the scope of the organization that lets them uh, step down? I don't think there is one size that fits all. Yeah, that is, yeah. And that's part of what can to be honest. I always like to have options. And I never would love to see my kids cornered that you must work in the family exactly. business. They, even if they like it, they will feel in Oma they had the, yeah, it's always greener on the other side of the river. But no, if I had this job or this opportunity, it would have been better. And that's why it always works even with them. Yani, when I tell them, you are not forced, I will never, this is what I tell, I will never force you. And one day come and tell you, you must come and take my position. Unless you like it. But what I would wish to see is that to, to have an institution where the business is running and they would come one day and say, we want to be part of this. I mean, they see something which is attractive to them to come and say, I want to be part of this. And I tell them it's not necessarily to, do, to join the same company. You can, and you can come and uh, achieve your dreams within the family business, within the organization. So what I would wish is to transform from me being running the business as a company to be rather running the family business. And this is one of the uh, investments or the companies within the family business. Reverse psychology. Yeah. Giving them the option. It's not yeah, it's very, it's giving them the option. They deserve to have this option. I think you, just, okay. uh, just, I mean, when you started by asking what, what can, I mean, what do the, does the business community need and what is needed and what you will develop? I think it would be very interesting to have a lot of learnings from successful, you, you have, especially in Europe, for example, we have 13 generations and 18 generations and numbers that I don't know how they've been through, the wars and the famines and everything. And these family businesses live on. And so, and there's very little literature on the success, especially in the luxury and jewelry uh, and design industry. They're, they are, they're mainly family businesses. So how do they succeed? What are the big challenges they faced in the fourth generation? Or, and I think this would be something that's very interesting to get that literature or get workshops that are around these success stories that are there but are not necessarily available to read on because it's so private. And, and they by now completely transformed into corporates, right? Not necessarily. Not as I, I'm currently uh, doing my master's in luxury management. So a focus is it on manage, on luxury businesses. We visited a wine uh, brand that's been 14 generations. It's very family run, amazing governance, privately owned completely within the family. Every that's generation the has a That's the combination. But, how, combination. Yeah, but, but getting into the, how did they survive World War II? I don't know, they don't tell you, yeah. they tell you the yeah. success story. Yeah, and thank you uh, Fatma for bringing that point because my, I was going to shift the conversation uh, under the label. So how okay. can we help uh, through an action plan? Just what I wanted to conclude, uh, on something that uh, Mohammed uh, Hatim uh, Dalia alluded to. Uh, obviously, uh, you guys are the expert. I'm no expert whatsoever when it comes to uh, family business. But I actually read, I was doing a, a bit of a, of a research before uh, organizing this uh, round table. And I go back to the 30s and the 40s in the US and in Egypt. At a point that Mohammed uh, alluded to, uh, and I think also Lubna. Uh, Mr. Sarnawi, in Cairo, and Mr. Macy's downtown New York used to stand at the door, and if someone is going out of the door with nothing, or maybe with a product, 
he would accompany them back, nothing in this whole store, please do, and force them to buy. Obviously, that was one store. He's the Mr. Uh, owner. Nowadays, you cannot do that because of the multiplicity, the, the, the chains, the spread, and so on and so forth. Amazon. Amazon. So the, 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 the movement and the change that happened in the model, I'm not sure the families moved at the same pace. And, 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 I, and I think this is across the region, not just in Egypt. How many businesses, and going back to a point that Dalia mentioned uh, explicitly, how many businesses, businesses are identified by the name of the company and not the name of the family or the person? So in some cases, uh, the, the thing is, it's my family, it's my shirk, that it works, like in your case. Like in Masa, in your case, it's not, and so on. Fa, fa, so I just wanted to ask you, Hagan. So I wanted to conclude by shifting the conversation. How can we help? It's by allowing your consumers to associate with your brand. How can we as business school help? School help. Yeah. How can this consult? Yeah, I think Harvard. You see Harvard, Stanford, the executive courses tailored to the family businesses where family members come yeah. as a group. Yeah. It's not uh, one family member attend that be bad. If you had a design that I program, okay. it's uh, a group of three and so on. You mean do you mean in house? Group well uh, member from each family. No, no, member from each family and family uh yeah we are uh yeah 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 seven seven families attend the group. Ah okay, no, uh, okay. Uh, group. Yeah. Uh, each family yes. three of uh, the yes. family yes. attend. Yes. Uh, no, because no. some subjects are very sensitive. Uh, for example what Reem said about yes. the age of stepping down. I cannot address my father or my uncle that uh, yeah. this is the right age, but when he's when, when it is in uh, formal course, where well, this is the normal so the practice and so on, yeah. so it's not me, I'm not saying I'm yeah. sure. But, but Salah, I would like to say something. It shouldn't necessarily be stepping down, it's stepping up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah, you should step up. Yeah. Uh, eventually, yeah. Yeah. when all of you will step up someday. <laughs> no, I mean, it's to step up. When, uh, you mean not exactly the chair? Not the exact the chair. Yeah. To be, yeah. Yeah. To be yeah. a part of the board. That's a great way to put it, for sure. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's part of the, the it's part of the, the, the continuity yeah. and the, the succession legacy. of this, the legacy. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I have a very quick uh, experience. Uh, I had a meeting last week with one of the biggest family business in Egypt, family, family in Egypt who was running a very successful family business. And the guy was telling me about this course in Harvard where they, he attended with his father and his brother. And actually his father, in just during the course, he decided that when he returned back to his family, as a CEO and uh, start the process of hiring. And, and it, it might be helpful the school to be a, a very objective party. Uh, and it, it lifts all the pressure from second and third generation. Right. To, to go back to what you were saying, it's it's uh, it's all about messaging and, and how you how you put your brand out there. Some some so you have the family name and the brand. Depends on on the ownership and what they decide. Who's going to be put out there with greater weight behind it? So that's what people need to be taught. How do you establish your value proposition behind the brand? How is it always about the brand, not about the individuals? How do you, how do you, how do you make that value proposition consistent? How do you set up the core values of the institution? How do you have people in the institution have an identity that's consistent with the brand? How do you make the brand the overwhelming element rather than the family name? If it's always about the family members stepping out there and taking the podium, it will always be about the family name. But if you're able to to, to, to have the, 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 the Steve Jobs step back and the Apple is in the, is in the forefront, it's not a smaller name than, uh, than, than Apple was. It's just the way they placed yeah. the brand yeah. in front of the, the, uh, I agree. the ownership. So whatever uh, uh, forces or... Well, I want to say something. Having the family name within the brand is an issue. If I want to plan to exit a certain business, I have to get a family name out. out. 
Let's say not otherwise yes. you are you are selling the family emotional uh, name. I mean it's emotional for that, that it is the best emotion. Um, sometimes the newcomer might destroy the name. Yeah, I cannot I cannot put the same emotion is coming in. And I have experience before the IQ and I'm selling majority of the company and plus military effect. Emotion. Emotion. That's what I had the dream of the IQ from the beginning. Okay. I take two things. Toyota actually is after the name of Toyota, which is a family name. Interestingly enough, after the crisis they had with the with the accelerator, they actually brought one of the family members back on board, and they took this as going back to their old traditions. Now, it, yes, there are some family businesses that are a long time ago, but when you look in the U.S. at least. I mean, Mars is a family business. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. 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 1911 or so. When you look at Johnson Coach, for example, Coach, Coach is a family yeah. dollar. Coach, Coach is, is, is a family yeah. business. It's not key for There are lots of examples. But I have to agree that they morph into a home somehow. But there are still some essence of this family in terms of values. Definitely. It's the values. And I think it's the balance that Hakan was talking about. It's the balance of the values. And a lot of brands, Dior for example, there is no one of the Dior family is on, but it maintains the, the, the name of the... So, BM, BM is a family owner. Yes. I mean, the one family, they own, they own at least 51% of, 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 and they control it. No, that's less. What's that? Less than. It's much less. Uh, I think it's, it's controlling. 51. I think it's controlling. Well, I can control it. Yes. I think I, I can. I can. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question just about the, the thing? I, I hear you about the exact forces for family businesses together as a group, and actually we have one that will be running in March with that's an IFC. We let you all know about it, and we're requiring that at least two people from the family business join together. And we've also done an awareness program with uh, EBRT for women and family businesses. And there are certain issues where we think that it's good to have a certain group together and others where you want a larger group. The women that we had the awareness day with said that we want you to give the same awareness to the other members of our family board without us there. So that they hear from outsiders the kinds of things we, we, we uh, can't say. But since this consortium is basically an Arab region consortium, I'd like to hear from you in your different businesses what kind of lessons you think would be useful from the Arab region so that if as business schools in Morocco, Lebanon, Egypt and UAE work together, what can bring you that is relevant? Is the Arab focus enough or should we have, you wanted the international experiences which again through our partnerships we can get. But I would like to know the value of the Arab focus. I, I, mean, I, I believe we are in the Arab world and we like to have cases from the Arab world. Okay. Case. And not only that, we'd like to see the person who was behind it, someone to talk to. It's very valuable. Okay. Yeah, I would love to see this become like a club. Mm. Of Arab and, family businesses. Yeah, and we meet regularly yeah. and we That's discuss a topic every time with a business case with someone attending. My question is based on this point, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat something I said maybe quickly at the beginning. Uh, this consortium, at least as it stands now, is going to meet as consortium, but also we'll be organizing a conference on family business every year uh, in a different location. And the intention is, it's not about academia, it's about bridging uh, the divide between academia and business and industry and it would be extremely beneficial to each and every conference that the participants the part uh, and workshops and, and panels and so on come from business and industry as well as academia so that that fits, uh, yeah, but, fits uh, but don't, don't make it a big no no it's not going to be big yeah, yeah. Yeah, round table is no 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 I went with the retail, so we tried to open, for example, an eye shop in GCC and it did not work well in the beginning. And when we parted with the uh, Indian department who was based there, yeah. it did very well. Yeah. So it's doing well. So uh, we, 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 I wish I could hear more from the 
lo local uh, okay. partners there or uh, we could meet them somehow, I don't know where. I, again, sharing the knowledge, as you rightly uh, said it, uh, or, and that is a good case. And one of the things that we were entertaining this morning is to um, put together a book, could be a book, of cases yes. on, I would hope, failing and mm. succeed, succeeding family cases. Because we all we only learn from the, the failures, not from the success. Uh, family businesses from across, across the region. Uh, that is a long-term project. So to get people to write it, review it, edit it, and so on, coming from academia, this is a one and a half to two years project. If we push it really hard, it's gonna be one and a half a uh, year. But to do that, we need to have the buying of enough businesses uh, to share their uh, experiences. So let me just, as a sample, amongst yourselves, would anybody be interested to share your own experiences in a case, in a book, that speaks about family businesses in the region? Yes. Anybody from around the world? Yes. Yes. But I want to ask something. It's not going to be only narrative. It's going to be financial analysis, too, right? To be, to, to be a, a value added, absolutely, yes. So are, we, are you willing to expose financial statements, those that are not on IPO? Because we do have this issue of people sharing the real... You know, you know I, I agree, I totally agree with you, but let, let, let's just, to make it a bit simpler for everybody, yeah, even the Harvard case, case and so on, they usually go back a few years. Okay. So that's fine. Mission 20 years. Yeah, like yeah, two, three years. years yeah. Fatma said yes. Anybody else would be interested? Yes. Yeah. Lobna, Amer, to want more content. So what we look? Sorry. Sorry, I think it would also be very interesting to get smaller because looking at the presentation at the beginning, where the majority of family businesses are much smaller, yeah. and I think everyone around the table here is at a much more advanced stage. It would be very interesting to bring into this community, or maybe in a different one, but the smaller family businesses with their challenges and their case studies that impacts a larger segment of the market. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, do you think that it is advisable that uh, the point that you have made about having a club so how to take it to, to another vehicle or a, a, a complementary vehicle to have like a swap team of business people, of families or uh, owners and uh, who, who are on, on call uh, why don't we meet uh, whoever is, is free uh, to share his or her uh, idea about the challenge that we are faced with if we are mentoring uh, uh, young uh, graduates and uh, MBA students, why don't we not mentoring but share with one another experiences? You know, for instance, I, I, I heard you today about the thing about you have an issue technically. I might have a solution for you. Why don't I pass on to you this solution? Because we have been a bit shy of availing our time to our colleagues. We can have that over coffee or something. I mean, if, why, why don't we help one another? And by the way, this is not Samaritan uh, perspective. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's very, very egocentric from me because I want to learn from you. So I will, I will invest time in exchanging views and listening from you how to become a better executive. Uh, I've heard about these groups uh, elsewhere than in Egypt, and they are very functional because it has the, the people who are advanced and the not so advanced. And by the way, the challenges are the same, but they are very the same. So I can tell you that you have a problem that will, will arise in one year, yes. for instance. Please let us work on it now. And share with you the ins and outs. Maybe you would need to consult a consultant. And you know that this consultant will charge you that huge amount of money, but you need that consultant. Maybe through leveraging our already existing relationship with that consultant, get you a good deal. These are the things that I think that we are not doing quite uh, aggressively in our entourage. And I think we have to start doing them. It's very crucial that we start doing them. Because why are we getting away from, again, our belief system? I, I, think, uh, I think the point is, uh, for this to, I think it's a very good, it's an excellent idea. But for it to succeed, you have to, uh, to have something to gather you. Gather you. And itself, uh, we should go into a meeting like this without you know, a schedule or a meeting or a, a, an agenda be very different. So you need somebody to harbor, uh, to harbor, to, yeah, to, to, to take care, to take care and invite, invite from several uh, uh, 
because now our business, business is in the nagging business. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but this is important. The second important thing is what I heard about from this people is always speaking about the, the top management, the owners, the family members. Mm -hmm. Nobody addresses our real issues, which is the management which we need to run our own business. Mm -hmm. Now, this is nobody's fault about this. This is even more important than us. Yes. So, uh, are you addressing this point? Yes. How are you going to teach those people? And what are you going to teach them? Because for sure they're not there. We don't find them. Mm -hmm. okay? And if we find them, they don't want to join us. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and it's, it's not our problem as well, because and I'm sure around this table, most of the family companies here are paying uh, the same uh, packages as international companies, or else they couldn't be hired. No, no way. But there's something wrong. And, and I was going to kind of bring a list on it, and again, something that Ahmed and Mohammed uh, mentioned. So, and I think Hakim as well. So, the younger generations are more, at least from the crowd we're talking about, are more. Uh, more than before, sending their kids to study uh, elsewhere. So, but, 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 but how do you do business in Egypt? That one minute. He said 10 out of the 12 people invited were ready for the year. Oh. This proves the point that you educate the entrepreneurs. So, now you have to uh, you have to create now management for those entrepreneurs. You mean middle management? Of course. Yes. Okay. Well, you okay. see what our yes. 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 Besides what you're saying, in no, doing business in Egypt is you can't find it in a book. But I think that's another gap that we need to address how to run the business. And I'm sure it's the same in Lebanon and the OEA with different variations. I'm positive. Yeah. So how to do the business here? Actually, it's the middle management. It's not like the middle management. It's either in the higher management or in the third generation of the entry level. الطب أي في اللي في النص بقى ده الحيط في في كوية كده هنا هما دول اللي عاملين إشي they're not part of the family and they're not newcomers فا وهما في منهم كتير قوي most of you I think will agree with me بنو كتير وسنين في الشركة فا هي بصعب جدا إن كن يعني to get someone who would be who is a fresh graduate تحطوا مانجر على ناس بقالها 25 سنة في 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 سايكولوجيكال بارير جامدة جدا and make sure he performs well and until he proves himself this might take يعني this is this is the the, the rigid core that I that I mentioned yes. in mm -hmm. our experience it's uh, again for us we we adopted uh, governance not for family members not for how should cousins join the business because and from our opinion, from our from where we stand, this is not a concern. It's not something that we that we that we think about. It's governance to transition what started as 1,200 uh, uh, employees and now is 2,500 employees. How to transition them and have them operate as one unit, as one team. So that's 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 the biggest challenge. Is how how you move through that rigid core. How you introduce new calibers to that to that core while respecting the core that built you, you know? And then also, these new calibers, uh, 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 are they going to, to, to be able to be qualified to lead some uh, industry veterans in, in this area? So moving through that rigid core is, is one of the challenges we've had some success with, not, not uh, complete success. Uh, uh, and it's actually using governance to transition the masses of the company. It's not about cousins and, and, uh, and brothers and sisters, for, for us at least. It's, uh, it's different. Can I ask another question to the family businesses around the table? Are there family businesses in your value chains? And is that, does it make a difference? Many. Well, yeah, in the supply chain. Oh. Yeah, you can, from your own value chain in the company, do you work with family businesses who are part of your yes. supply chain? Oh, yes. Does it make a difference that they are a family business? Of course it does. I don't know. Publicly we can't. There's another 
not your own family, but other family businesses? Oh, the many businesses. Are there other clients? Oh, 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 oh. Are there yes. family businesses as well? Oh, Does no. this make a difference? So that the wider ecosystem of your business includes oh, your different supply, family businesses. So, so th that works. I just want to add something on uh, what we have listened to today, that there are different challenges uh, resonating in what, in what you mentioned, Dalia. Uh, the idea of having middle management, they have no ambitions to reach the top management. So there is a sort of glass ceiling, and it is depending mainly upon how are we doing the governance. If we are in a big company, we can afford to do some sort of a governance, and we can afford to pay the middle management enough money or enough benefits. And if we are in a small company or a, a medium-sized company, you cannot afford to get the highest capital. So the, the thing that will happen eventually, coming from a family business background, is that we have some sort of a glossy. ceiling. So what, what will happen eventually, they, they have no motivation and nothing will happen. So they are not motivated to do anything. But for a company like Eco, for example, they have institutionalized their business, they can afford to get the highest caliber, and they can afford to take the decision, okay, now we move into institutionalization. We can step down and do the governance, and maybe Ashraf, who is an employee and not a family member, he is highly competent, we are valuing him, we are getting him into better positions. So the, the challenges are different. So I think we, when we are, we are studying this, we must uh, study it on multi-levels. Yeah. The challenges. And that's the point that Tata alluded to yes. earlier. You know, the, the soft one size that fits all. Yes. And, and I think the learning curve should be more with the younger, uh, most recent uh, family business that, that's just started uh, to learn from the, the, the those who are have been around for some time. Uh, yes. Yeah, if you may add something, it's sure. a compromise between the idea of interaction and the idea of creating a club. We can have a series of talks similar to the transforming Egypt, meet the CEO, let's say for example by uh, by monthly or each quarter to have someone from the family business sharing a challenge, sharing a success story, someone even from abroad that AUC can host just to have some sort of discussion regarding the challenges and some issues. Sure, sure. Uh, and on this point that I mean is mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you probably in March, David uh, Beatty, March. So this is a guy who specializes in corporate governance. I'll share with you the... the, the, the Christine Blondel, uh, Christine Blondel, Christine April. Blondel April. 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 April, yeah. Blondel is the founder of the Family Business Institute at Inzia. Oh. And she's coming to visit us in Both of them will be here. I'll surely extend to you the invitation if you have time, if you want to send someone to, to, to attend. Uh, Ahmed. No, I wanted to come uh, for, for Dalia. In, uh, opening up the structure of the organization to give a chance for new candidates to come in and eventually start going up, replacing those who are the old guard in the organization. Usually keeping the structure as it is doesn't allow for anyone to be promoted. Once you force the structure to open up and bring up new positions for these people to show up. And honestly, the, the best thing that doesn't disturb the organization is when you bring people from down up rather than hiring people from outside in top positions. It disturbs the organization a lot, unless someone with a special talent that you need. What else? Uh, yes, in most, so in most cases, uh, we've, we've had the same experience that building from, from, from bottom up and, and building your calibers, uh, your senior positions from people within the institution, this is, this is the, 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 the most successful way to go about it. Some other areas you have to introduce others because you simply cannot uh, uh, grow it uh, inside the company and also the pace of, of moving forward. Uh, but then again, when you invite new people into your institution, you need to you need to have 
adopted that culture, that new culture that you want to be yourself. This I, I keep emphasizing this because we live this every day, finding your identity and living your culture within. Because if you assume that uh, that people that come from uh, multinational institutions will always come with. Uh, with, with the greatest of stories, this is a very false assumption. I mean, more than often, they come with issues. They come with they come from an institution where they've learned not to trust many people around them. So we actually deal with them when they come in. We have them in an orientation phase where we tell them, you know, on the ground here, it's not so. Uh, there's a sense of loyalty. You can trust the guy sitting next to you. So it's it's uh, yeah, building building bottom up, and in cases where you will invite people on board. We need to have that culture uh, actually operation and not just on papers and value charts on the board and things like that. Another one find that is, uh, is more sensitive, but again, I'm not sure, it doesn't apply to people on the table before, but I see this with maybe smaller family businesses, is the financial issues. I mean, when the CFO is very loyal to either a family member or very loyal to the chairman or to the owners, and then things get very uh, mixed up. So sometimes you see even family trips to Europe on the accounts of the family because it gets deducted from the taxes. Or in one of our, uh, I say, we have seen this lately that one of the board members, the chairman, decided to take 7 million pounds to buy an S-class. So, and nobody talked about it. I mean, nobody can challenge these things because it's very sensitive, it's family, and it's his money over money at the end. At the end, and, and it's like, it's my money. So I mean, these, are these issues open for discussion with family businesses? It's very sensitive, it raises a lot of problems, but it blocks also a lot of growth. It blocks private equity firms. It's usually one of the blocking points. It blocks foreign investments. Uh, if it passes, if they, I mean, things move with local banks, not in the it even sometimes move with us cases like this. But it is a block, and it, yeah. we might need to talk about it. It's, it's, it's something that, that uh, if, I, if I may add, uh, if you're going to make that transition, if you're interested you as a family, this. you need to manage your financial disciplines from day one. There's no joke about this. If you're going to have external board members, and at the closing of every uh, financial year, on the shareholders' account, they're going to find a funny story, then, then you've, you've taken the wrong path. You've, you've, you've day one, the day you decide to do that transition, manage your financial disciplines. End of story. Shall shareholders' the accounts policy. are... Yes. The policy and the procedures. Exactly, yeah. The resistance is high. If the resistance is high, then you're not ready to make that transition. You need to kill that resistance. You need to manage your financial disciplines. Shareholders' accounts need to be very caref carefully scrutinized, uh, uh, zeroed out at the start, taken care of, cleaned up. Once this is done, that's it. You've made that. You've made that decision consciously. You always need to keep that in mind. If you don't want that, don't go there. It's a choice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for all these uh, really interesting insights and uh, ideas you shared with us. I just want to tell uh, our friend Samir that uh, from the other side of uh, North Africa and the Arab world in Morocco, I feel very comfortable of, uh, with your presentation because that could be a presentation from Moroccan owner <laughs> in the family business <laughs> having. Uh, uh, this kind of challenges, how to be sustainable and how many companies uh, do not uh, uh, exist after uh, having the, the head of the company that is passed pass out or uh, decide to stop the business or things like this. I think we have, uh, at the same time, what I heard is something very common in our, re into our region. We are building this consortium to bring uh, relevant content, and I'm sure we're going to learn from each other. Uh, content from research, and if it's uh, well done and good, it will be relevant to businesses, because we need to serve companies uh, and businesses that we can all together serve our society. For job creation, for having sustainable things, for tackling gender issues and so on and so on. So uh, I learned a lot from what I have heard and what I want to say is that all that ideas are uh, very useful for us for the next steps. What we, what we need uh, maybe is 
to uh, to crystallize, to to put that in a basket, and to keep it as very valuable things that we are going to use in the next steps within research, within executive education, and uh, uh, to share. Uh, in our writings and in our contents, maybe uh, on books or things like this. I had one issue that was, uh, I found very interesting. The, the issue about uh, family names and brands. Some of the companies have a brand for the company and, and family name is behind the brand. And we, we always think that this brand is very deeply and hardly linked to the, 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 the name of the family. Some others made the, the name of the, of the group or, or of the family as a brand. And in our cultures that have similar things, it's not always easy to put the brand, to put the family name in the front as a brand. And one of the topics I, I think that we have to, to work on as researchers is uh, what about the family names that are brands in the region? How do the brands live? How do the brands live with that core beliefs and with that values? Because having uh, names as a brand uh, in Western countries, I mean, we, we teach that and we, we were educated with uh, this kind of cases. But we don't have enough material from the region and we don't have enough material that we can share. What about the culture? Because it's an, in a way an anthropology issue at the same time as a business issue. How do we, how can we make that brands live with the family, uh, more than with the family, with the society, with the customers? Because some brands uh, turn to be part of, part of the intangible capital of, or asset of the whole country, and, and not only of the family. And uh, we need in the Arab region maybe to to tackle that uh, uh, issue and challenge to find what could be the levers, what could be the pillars that we, we have to work on and, and share that we can, and, and in Egypt, you have uh, more and more in international companies that work more widely in the region in East Africa, Africa, uh, and North Africa, so I think what I have heard uh, here in AUC uh, coming from uh, uh, business and business leaders is something that uh, is very positive for the future of the consortium. Uh, and please do not hesitate if you think that there are some topics we can work on also, maybe some questions. Uh, we as academics need to be challenged by your uh, practical information, your practical uh, 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 challenges that we can maybe think and go back to other colleagues and try to find similar issues and similar contacts that we can share. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. for this Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, thank you, Tammy. And uh, I would like to, again, thank everybody for uh, making the time and, and joining us today. Uh, as you both said, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, as you can expect, we will uh, we'll draft uh, a proposal for an action plan. And if you don't mind, we'll run it by you by email. Always uh, insights and inputs and ideas will be extremely useful, as today, uh, to structure uh, whatever services we will be offering. And again, I'm repeating myself, this is not just for the constituents of the school or the university, but this is for the market at large. So uh, given that you guys, yourselves, are the uh, family business uh, leaders and owners uh, representative of the bigger picture, uh, we need to offer something that you would want and that will be adaptive to what the market wants and what the market needs. So again, we'll come, we'll come back to you and uh, for your inputs and so on and, and, and we take it from there. And once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.